In a symposium on Tuesday, April 26, 2011, former top U.S. government officials called for urgent U.S. government and United Nations action to protect 3,400 residents in Camp Ashraf. Among the speakers at the symposium were Andrew Card, White House Chief of Staff 2001 to 2006, Howard Dean, former DNC Chairman, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, Tom Ridge, Homeland Security Secretary 2003 to 2005, Philip Zilikow, Senior Counselor to the State Department 2005 to 2007, Michael Sheehan, State Department Coordinator for Counterterrorism 1998 to 2000, and Colonel Gary Morsh, Medical Doctor, U.S. Army Reserves and President of Heart to Heart International. Ambassador Rees chairing the symposium noted that the bipartisan panel agreed that the Iraqi regime has betrayed its promises to the U.S. military and can't be trusted. We agree that the U.S. government is betraying its solemn promise to the residents of Camp Ashraf, betraying our own national security interests to promote regime change in Iran, and our own values of democracy, freedom, and human rights. And then there was a break in the conversation at the front of the classroom, and I walked up to the president, and I leaned over and I whispered into his right ear. A second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. I tell you that story because if it weren't for that experience that I had, I would not be here today. Actually, if it weren't for that day, you might not be here today for a very different reason. Because I watched the president transform that day from someone who was elected to be president to someone who carried the burdens of being president. But probably one of the greatest changes came in a very, very short statement, not too many days later. And it was a change in our nation's foreign policy when the President invited the world with a pretty stark statement, you're either with us or against us. And there's not a doubt in my mind that when the President said that, there were world leaders in countries around the world squirming in their seat. Don't make me pick. I want to be with you and against you. I want to be on the sidelines. But the President said, you're either with us or against us. Not a lot of people in America talked about the MEK. It was a community distant from that which we thought about. And then the change in the world manifested itself with the war in Afghanistan and meeting a challenge in Iraq. And that question, you're either with us or against us, was raised again. And the MEK was nervous. You know, we think a lot of people want to hurt us. And the U.S. said, don't worry. We'll help to protect you. We'll help to protect you. And they did. And the MEK got stronger. Stronger as a society. In a place where other societies were becoming more challenged. The MEK got stronger. The institutions of government were working. People were hopeful. And transitions were taking place. The transitions reached the point where we said, as a country, to Iraq, you're standing on your own two feet. We respect that, and we want to help you stand for a long time. We have helped you build an institution called democracy, 
It will struggle. Our own democracy struggled. But the MEK was nervous. And the U.S. said, we'll be there. We're helping you. And they helped to a point of transition. And the transition came. But the fears reemerged. Because what happened during that transition was that the State Department didn't transition. The State Department didn't recognize all that was a reality to those who were on the ground making a difference. The MEK was our ally in the war on terror. The MEK was an ally in a push for people to have a say in government. The MEK is an ally on undermining regimes that don't serve their people well. But the State Department was left behind. Left behind with a document that is irrelevant today. And the courts have said, check its relevance. My prayerful hope is that the State Department is checking what is relevant today. And they will see today for what it is, rather than a yesterday that they didn't understand or know. It is time for the MEK to be recognized for what it really is. A place where freedoms are practiced, opportunities are realized, hopes are more than just hope. Where seeds of democracy have taken root and they're looking to be transplanted in a country that desperately needs those roots to be able to grow. It's a place where Muslims work to get along rather than to fight. It's a place where women are not only empowered, they are the power. When General Oriano walked in to negotiate with the MEK, who sat across from him? This bull of a man was met with a woman who was strong as an ox. What a signal. What a hope realized. What an example. But I'll come back to that day, September 11th, 2001, a day that did change me, a day that invited phenomenal leadership, and many of our leaders rose to the challenge. President Bush, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, right at the top of the list. Calls were made and they were answered. Tom Ridge got a phone call. And he answered it, and he showed up to make a difference. You have had a day that will live in infamy. It was April 8th, 2011. A day that shouldn't have happened because you were in a safe place.
place. You had been given assurances. You followed the rules. You laid down your arms. You accepted a community. You recognized a role. But you were abused. You were bullied. And an audience right next door was cheering the bully on. And no one challenged the bully. Because the war on terror is not over. I hope that the US will stand up and say, the MEK is the example that others can follow in the entire region of the Middle East. I had been blessed with experiences working for President Reagan and President George H.W. Bush. And I'd served under every chief of staff scenario that served them. So I kind of knew the job vicariously. But I decided my job as chief of staff was not to allow emotions to dictate my counsel. To try to be as objective as possible, to give the president the best possible advice without having it be emotionally charged. And you are emotionally charged, and that's a good thing. But your leaders must be objective and careful, and our leaders have to be objective and careful. They also have to have resolve. They have to stand for something. And quite frankly, they have to live up to the titles that they have, leaders. And we desperately need more leadership with regard to the MEK and what is going to happen in terms of its relationship in Iraq, its relationship with Iran, and its example to the world. I pray that America provides the leadership to allow you to be the example that others should follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I've spent about 30 some odd years, my entire adult life actually involved in, I'm a career military officer, special forces officer, but most of my career has been involved in counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, counter narcotics, and law enforcement. First of all, let me tell you about the nature of how I consider the regime. They don't want to get caught in that type of blatant terrorism event like they did in 92, 94, and 96. They've also gone back to that playbook, and that is their primary playbook. Find opportunities to pursue their interests in the region and globally by funding, training, and indoctrinating militia groups that will do the dirty work for them. And that's obviously what they've been doing in Iraq. Uh, General McChrystal and General Petraeus were very articulate on this, of how the Iranian Quds forces of the, uh, 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 the IRGC were actively training, supporting, and arming groups that were killing American soldiers in Iraq. They also, which is very odd as well, got involved in supporting the Taliban. At the same time, Ahmadinejad was meeting with Karzai. His thugs were training Taliban that were trying to uh, kill Karzai. So they, they, they play this double game even when leaders of the region know it, and particularly in their neighbors in Iraq and Afghanistan. They know they're playing a double game, but they still do it in order to leverage pressure, intimidate, and terrorize the leadership around uh, their region. Let me talk a little bit about the MEK, because that's really why I'm here, is I'm one of those evil State Department guys who uh, was at blame for, for much. I mean, I mean, I'm not an apologist for the State Department. Of my 30 years in government, I was there for about three of the years. But I did serve on the National Security Council under, under two administrations, in, in Bush 41 and Clinton, and I also served uh, in, in the Pentagon in different, different places um, before I finished at NYPD a few years back. We designate state sponsors of terrorists. And of course, Iran is number one and Syria is number two on that list. Really, the two only countries that are actively involved in supporting terrorism right now. Even the North Koreans, as wacky as they are, the Sudanese, they've really, they've really diminished their support for terrorism. Those are the two uh, that are most active. Um, that process is fundamentally a political process.